We're beginning a brand new series this Sunday on the book of Habakkuk. And um, we'll probably, over the past, uh, well, from now on, throughout the past, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying past, <laughs> to the future, uh, we will be uh, spending about five weeks on the book of Habakkuk. Um, and as we do, I well, one of the things that you will have to do, an assignment would be for you to go home and read the book of Habakkuk in one sitting. Okay? Don't like, it'll just take you like, what, 10 minutes maybe, 15 or less, depending on how fast you read. But um, I want you to go home and read it and meditate on it. It's only three chapters. Okay? So if you've never um, read the book before, or if you... If this is your first time finding out there's such a book in the Bible called Habakkuk, um, <laughs> please go and read it. It's in your Bible. Um, so, <clears throat> here we go. The first part on the book of Habakkuk. Uh, I've uh, entitled it uh, Part 1, and I thought for all of that, we'll get to what that means later on. Now, to begin with, can anyone name the four proper steps involved in a legitimate prayer? The four proper steps that are involved in what's considered a good prayer, a legitimate prayer. Now, okay, some of you guys might have heard the acronym called ACTS, right? ACTS, yeah, okay. It's a, it's a, a simple method that uh, some people use to uh, teach perhaps a new believer on how to pray. Okay, it's an acronym ACTS, that which stands for the A stands for adoration. Right, you give God praise. Uh, you give God praise for who God is and for the things that He has done, for His sovereignty, and you uh, lift Him up. You praise Him. Adoration. C stands for confession. Confession means confession. You tell God who you are, the fact that you're a sinner and that you're not worthy, and that you're in need of His mercy and His guidance. Uh, A-C-T. T stands for thanksgiving. Uh, you thank God for who He is, and the fact that He has made you, and that, uh, that forgiveness is available to you through the cross. And then last but not least, uh, you make supplication, right? You pray to God, requesting for God's assistance on the issues surrounding your life circumstance, right? So, uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, yes. But now, what's missing? One of the elements, or maybe few elements that are missing in that prayer method is a complaint. You might be asking, so where, where, where do you complain to God? Where's the, where's the room to complain? Now, we usually think complaining to God is not a mature way to pray. That is actually, complaining is actually a sign of irreverence in your spiritual immaturity. See, you don't teach a new believer, okay, after you, you know, praise God and then make, make confession and then you thank God and then, you know, you pray about your, uh, you know, issues in life and then, the lastly, you know, you complain to God. You don't teach that to a new believer, do you? What? You forget to complain to God? You gotta, you gotta do it like you mean it, right? Get angry with God. You don't teach that to a new believer, right? Or, uh, you don't teach a new believer when he prays that, you know what, you need to, um, you know, along somewhere as you pray, you need to start asking God questions, accuse Him, doubt, do these things as you pray. Nobody says that, right? Nobody says that. Nobody teaches you to, hey, you need to doubt God. You need to complain to God. You need to get angry with God. Nobody teaches you these things as a part of a proper way, or a legitimate way of praying. But think about it. I don't know about your prayer, but about my, when it comes to my prayer, I think over half of it are complaints. Not all the time, but, you know... A good chunk of the time. I think oh, a lot of times, I think my prayer is made up of complaints and questions and doubts even sometimes. Right? 
Because see, if you're just wanting something from God, you will choose the nicest words to pray to God, right? You will choose the rehearsed phrases to tell God, you know, to speak to Him so that you will earn His favor so that you can finally get what it is that you want from God, right? If you're just wanting something from, from God, then all you have to do is to follow the code, right? To follow, you know, the, the, the written out phrases, right? You know, say the magic word or other things, right? Whatever it is that you do to get what it is, you know, uh, out of uh, that prayer from God. That's what you do. But if all you're doing is following these proper, so to speak, steps to prayer, and there's no emotions, and there are no serious doubts, and there's no complaints in your prayer, then what is that? If it's not just going through a, a, a set of religious routine, or what have you. See, even Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they will think they will be but for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Right? Do not babble like the pagans. The word babble comes from, as you know, the Tower of Babel, right? Where God confused their language and they kept on babbling to each other and they understood nothing. They didn't understand a thing they were saying. Right? So you keep on babbling things. And God says, What are you saying? I don't understand. You say all these fancy words and you just go on with your prayers, but I don't understand what you're saying, right? See, when you're truly wanting to have a conversation or a communication with somebody, what do you do? Sometimes you get emotionally all charged up. You get angry. Sometimes you ask questions. Sometimes you're in doubt. And sometimes, you know, these things go back and forth within a real communication, especially if the circumstance is dire, right? That's biblical. To include doubts and questions and complaints in your prayer is biblical. Look at Psalms. The psalmist is, is doing that all the time. He's very direct with God. God, why are you doing this? Or God, why are you not, do, not doing this? God, why is there so much evil in the world? God, I wish that you would just punish that guy for doing evil to me. And psalmist goes on to complain, do you even love me? Do you even remember me of my existence? See, if you remember, even Jesus, in a way, complained to God, right? Saying, what? Why did you abandon me? Even Jesus, to God, why did you abandon me? And that's a real question. And that's a real complaint. A legitimate complaint, I would say. The question that is. See, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12, it begins with these words. Lord, are you not from everlasting? Are you not from everlasting? Meaning, are you not infinite? Meaning, are you not almighty? Are you not all powerful? Meaning, are you not all that? I thought you were all that, and you're not is what he's saying. That's, what, that's the implication of that phrase. If you study the, the, the Hebrew you know, word, meaning behind what he's saying really here, Lord, are you not from everlasting? Are you not? That little phrase, are you not, is used in the Bible, throughout the Bible, 96 times. And this is the only place in the Bible where it's addressed directly to God, from a human being to God. See, when you say, you usually say these two uh, between... Uh, a human to human interaction, right? So, for instance, um, you know, I could be saying to you something like, um, "Are you, are you not the thief, right? Are you not the thief?" So you're saying, "I know you're a thief, but you're claiming that you're not." So let me ask you another way: Are you not a thief? Then what are you, right? You're sort of like making an accusation to this guy. So. The little phrase, are you not, is used in circumstances where two people are interchanging, exchanging conversation and they're sort of like accusing each other, right? Are you not this? Are you not that? Are you not crazy to be doing this of a sort, right? And this is the only place where it's used towards God. 
Are you not from everlasting? So he's asking, are you not almighty? I thought you were all powerful. I thought you were all that. But obviously you're not. That's, what, that's what's going on here. He's saying, what's wrong with you, God? What did I ever do to you to deserve this? See, if you haven't had this kind of feeling or expression towards God in your prayers, I dare say that there's something missing in your prayer life. I dare say. See, because God knows it all, and I know nothing, so there has got to be some questions, right? Some real questions. So deep relationships are all about deep questions, aren't they? If you're looking at injustice going on around you, there are problems that are around you and both around you and in your life, and you're not really asking God questions, and you're not really raising fists to the sky, and you're not really doubting God, and you're not really having this deep conversation with God, then there is something wrong with your prayer life, in a way. The book of Habakkuk is made up of three chapters. It's a short book, but a very old book, full of wisdom. The book is all about Prophet Habakkuk asking God some questions during a time when it's very bad, there's evil going on all over in the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah. And God answers him two different times. Now, this is a long time ago, but these issues, the conversation that's taking place between Prophet Habakkuk and God is very relevant to us as well. There's timeless truth to this that we should learn, all learn from. So now, chapter 1 and 2 is a conversation that's taking between God and uh, Prophet Habakkuk. So modernly put, chapters 1 and 2 is actually a plea or petition uh, you know, that, that Habakkuk is making towards God, but really what it is is a complaint that is making towards God. Let me break it down for you. Chapter 1, verses, you know, 1 is you know, introducing him, telling you who it is, the author is William telling you who it is, right? And so, chapter 1, verses 2 and 4 is Habakkuk's first complaint to God, right? And chapter 1, verses 5 through 11 is God's answer towards that first complaint. Chapter 1, verse 12 through 17 is Habakkuk's second complaint towards God. And chapter 2, the entire chapter, is God's answer to Habakkuk on that second complaint, or questions you might put. And then chapter 3 is Habakkuk's prayer and praise for the response that he got, he received from, you know, from God, right? Now he's, uh, as you can tell, he's giving God praise because he's happy, he's content, with the answers that is given. He's content with the realization and understanding he now has based on this entire process and experience. Now, what is the complaint about? What is he really essentially complaining? So we're going to uh, get to that. Now, the key verse, key verse in Habakkuk, as some of you guys may know, is what? The most famous verse in the, the book of Habakkuk. If you know it in Korean, you can say it in Korean. Or if, point out the chapter. Point, where, where is it? Chapter. Yeah, there's a, chapter 3 is famous too, but one single verse that's very well known. That's a key verse. The righteous shall live by faith. Okay? Uh, the, the newer translations, translation says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. But I like the older translation. But the righteous shall live by faith. It's very short and precise. That's a key verse. But So that's what we're going to do. As he gets to that point, until he gets to that point, how does he arrive at making such a confession? Right? The righteous shall live by faith. How does he arrive there? What is the process that he goes through? That's, a, that's what we're going to study. So first, backtrack a little bit. Let's go and study Habakkuk's first complaint. Now, his complaint is boils down to basically two questions. 
Verse 2. It says what? If you go to verse 2. Verse 2. Okay. Verse 2 is about the, the first word is how long? How long? Meaning, how long will all of this uh, evil and violence go on? See, in that time, there was such a you know a, a wide you know spread of violence and injustice and uh, idol worshiping, and the poor got poorer and the rich got richer. There's such a problem within the society and the nation as a whole that prophet Habakkuk was complaining to God. God, why are you allowing this? And the first question that he asks is, how long will this go on? Until when will this go on? So the first question is, how long? Verse 3, he's asking, why? Why do you let evil just be? Why do you let allow evil to take place? Why do you let allow evil to happen? Right? So, how long and why are the two questions essentially that he's asking. Now, Prophet Habakkuk was a prophet back in 600 BC. He was a Jew, and beyond that, we know nothing else about him. We know that the times that he lived in, again, as I said, you know, he he was living in the nation of Judah, and Judah was growing more evil by day. Right? So that's what we know. He was living in some evil times. It was a vicious cycle. And, 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 and he was complaining to God, how long will this go on for, and why do you allow this, ha this to happen? Now, folks, same thing again is happening in our world, right? There's evil happening. There's injustice everywhere. Now, if you find yourself quiet regard, in regards to these evil and injustice in this world, Think about that for a minute. You need to take some time to think about your silence towards the evil and injustice in this world. Are you really silent? And you're really okay with all the wrong things that are going on around you? People compromising on their uh, biblical principles and values. If you're okay with that, all you care about is just you living your life and you maintaining your well-being all by yourself. And you're so quiet and silent towards the problems in the rest of the world. You need to think about that. You need to think about the ways you can explain your silence towards injustice in this world. God, what's wrong with you? Why am I so silent? Just like Habakkuk, you need to be complaining and crying to God. Now, pay attention. This is what's going on. He's asking why, why, why? How long will this go on and why is this happening? So, for Habakkuk, that is the gist of his complaint is verse 4. Look at that. The verse 4 says, Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hen in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Those are the times that I was living in. So, here's God's first response to Habakkuk in verse 5. Now, this is incredible. Why, how long will this go on for? Why is there injustice in the world? And this is God's response to Habakkuk. What does he say? What does he say? Let's, let's read it together, verse 5. We don't have verse 5? Okay. Let's not read it together. <laughs> this is what's going to be reading for you. This is what's going on. Look at the nations and watch. This is what God says. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you wouldn't believe, even if you were told I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize the dwellings not their own. Wait a minute. What is he doing? He's saying, look around. 
and be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something in your days that you're not going to believe. I'm going to raise up the nation of Babylon and they're going to destroy you utterly. Uh, what? So he's saying, he's complaining, right? There's such, there, there's a whole lot of violence going on. There's injustice. What's wrong with this picture? How long will this go on? And why is this happening was the question. And the answer was, answer was what? Uh, you haven't seen the beginning of it yet. There's more to come. There's more problems that are coming. Why are you surprised? Why are you surprised over this? It hasn't even begun yet. That's what he's telling him. I'm going to raise up the nation of Babylon to destroy you. Uh, I was uh, looking for more of something in line, along the lines of, oh, okay, it's going to go on for another maybe two months and then it's going to be over, and about the evil going on and about the injustice in the world. I'm sorry about that. You know, there's a little mistake I made. Maybe somewhere along the line of that was the kind of answer Habakkuk was looking for. But here's God saying to him, uh, you haven't seen the beginning of it yet. It's just getting started. And guess what? I'm going to send this nation to destroy you. Interesting. And he's saying, you know what? Even if, I, even if I was to tell you what's going on, you're not going to understand. And so here's Habakkuk telling God, you know what? It doesn't matter. Just tell me. Tell me what it is. Tell me the reason, God. But God says, you're not going to understand. It's okay. Just tell me. All right. The Babylonians are going to attack you. What? I just complained to you about the violence that's already going on, but you're talking about adding all more violence, and I don't understand. And God says, see, you don't understand. That's exactly what's going on here. Or let's say this, okay, to, to help you understand a little better. You know, you're praying one day, you're mad and angry because, you know, you couldn't pay your uh, monthly payment on your car, right? And the bank took away your car. And you're complaining to God. God, the bank took away my car. I'm in such financial trouble. I'm in deep hole. What are you going to do? What do I do, Lord? And God says, you know what? The bank took away your car? Well, tomorrow, the bank's going to take away your house. And you go, what? I don't understand. Or maybe you broke your arm or something, right? You tell God, God, my arm's broken. It hurts. Why did this happen to me? And God says, well, tomorrow you're going to break your leg. Those are the kinds of answers that he's now receiving from God. Now, so we lead up to now his second complaint, right? His second set of complaints begins this way, verse 12, that we looked at, right? Lord, are you not from everlasting? I thought you were almighty. I thought you were all that. I thought you could resolve some issues in my life here. Come on, work with me. And then he finally says in verse Two, uh, verse 4 of chapter 2, the righteous shall live by faith. So how did he get there? How did he get there? From full of complaints to God telling him <laughs> weird answers to him saying, you know what? I understand now. The righteous shall live by faith. How did he get there? We're going to study that process. That's not a natural answer someone in his situation, in his shoes, is supposed to give. But ultimately, this is what we know about his confession. What he's saying, what Habakkuk is saying is that the believers, Christians, do not depend on our circumstances to determine whether or not we're going to be happy. We are not going to deter, be, uh, depend on our circumstances to determine whether or not we're going to remain happy or sad. If a problem-free life was the goal for being a Christian for you, then you've chosen a wrong religion wrong goal and wrong purpose purpose in life. And God here is almost forcing him, Habakkuk, and us to take the position of seeing things from God's perspective. See, you ask, again, let me, let me help you along. You're asking, hypothetically, right? God, why is this going on? Why is there such evil, right, injustice in the world? How long will this continue? Why is this happening? And God says, it'll get worse. The Babylonians are on the way to destroy Judah. The Babylonians, if they come, you're going to help us along, right? 
Well, you live by faith. You'll survive because you have faith. Trust me. What? Will you protect me then at least? Well, just live by faith. God, will you give me a job? Will I ever be married? Just live by faith. So if I live by faith, will you give me a job? So if I live by faith, will you give me a husband or a wife? Well, not exactly, but live by faith. What kind of saying? And you go, what? So living like this, living by faith, means just growing old as a single lady and no children and no jobs, and that's your way of saying live by faith? Okay, folks, hear me out. What am I doing right now? I'm complaining to God, right? This person is complaining to God. And that's what Habakkuk is doing exactly. He's carrying on a true and real and down-to-earth conversation with God. Now, this is what living by faith is about. As Habakkuk carries this real down-to-earth and true questions and doubts that he has towards God, as he carries on this question with God, conversation with God, Habakkuk never leaves God's presence. He's complaining, he's doubting, he's asking questions all before God and with God and to God and towards God. That's what he's doing. Now, ever since the beginning of creation, there has not been a time of true peace, right? There's earthquakes and there's hails and storms and the wars and their financial crisis. See, you think life will get better once this economic crisis is over? Do you think life is really going to be like heaven now that this new president is, you know, in the office? Do you really think everything's going to be okay if you just get that job, if you just marry that person, if you just get, you know, take, get, you know, this taken care of? Do you really think? It's going to be heaven from that point on? No. Then you ask yourself, what do I hold on to then? In this ever-changing world, what do I hold on to that's firm enough and that's secure enough? Is there anything unchanging in this ever-changing world? And God says, the Babylonians are coming. And Habakkuk, notices, as he says that, this calmness in the voice of God. The Babylonians are coming, but God's calm. And he begins, as he has this conversation for hours now, he's be he begins to study God's heart, God's intentions, and what God is really trying to communicate to him. And he realizes that what God is saying to him is, you know what, Habakkuk? That's life. Oh, here's a great joke. If you didn't hear that, that's life. See, you need to understand. See, once you're done and over with this problem in your life, right now, that problem that you're facing, that you think if that's over, you're, you're going to be set. If you just take care of that debt, if you just take care of that problem, if you just receive that promotion, if you just open up that one more business, if you just marry that person, if I just get into that college, everything will be over with enough. But after that, what well, God says, but the Babylonians are coming after that, then what are you going to do? That's what Habakkuk realizes, what God is saying. God is telling him, that's life. In life, there is no true peace. In life, it's a vicious cycle. They're full of problems. So why is God saying that? To let him down? To tell him, you know what? It's all over. There's no hope. So just, why don't you just die? <laughs> is that God's intention? No. God is saying, you know what? That's life. So what do I do? That everything's so insecure and everything's so changing all the time. Everything's always transitioning. What do I do in this ever-changing world? And God says, well, hold on to something that's unchanging, that's never changing. Faith in God, righteous, shall live by faith. That's when he understood it. And he said, ah, I see. 
See, folks, look at the big picture. Habakkuk doesn't know it yet. See, the people of that time did not know it yet, but this was what God was going We have the advantage of knowing what has taken place after Habakkuk's time, right? Because, you know, we're, now we're in 2013, right? 21st century. He was a prophet back in 600 BC. We know what's happened, right? So the nation of Judah falls apart. Babylonians do come and they destroy the nation. That's what happens. But because they're taken to Babylon as captives, this is what begins to happen. If you study the history, you know. The form of religion, the, the, uh, the Jewish religion, they used to gather in all one place and worship together in a massive, right? And, and, and thousands of people, and hundreds of thousands of people, they all gather in one central location and they worship God. But now, because of this captivity, what they began to do was they began to worship in small synagogues. They were all spread out in different places and they began to meet in small groups. So synagogue religious formation has begun to take place. So they begin to meet in small groups. So as a result of that captivity, they don't worship in one central location anymore, but they're spread all throughout the world, right? So in various locations. Now, based on this, during Roman colonization now, through Pax Romana, all roads were connected, right? Their Christianity began to take place. Christianity sprang up. And the first place, if you remember, like in uh, Acts chapter 13 or so, when uh, Apostle Paul first begins his ministry, right? Where does he go to preach his first sermon? He goes to a, before he preaches to foreigners, he goes to a synagogue to preach, right? See, that's what God was doing. There was persecution, but they were spread out in, in ways that they could begin to prepare themselves to be the church of Jesus Christ. You may be questioning right now, well, but God, what's wrong with my kid? What's wrong with my height? Why am I so short? Or, or why, why, do I have, why do I not have that job yet? You may be questioning all kinds of this, things, but you tell God, and you say to yourself in that moment, and you declare to the forces or people around you, to your circumstances, that righteous shall live by faith. Let's say that together. Righteous shall live by faith. One more time. Righteous shall live by faith. You declare to your circumstance and to yourself and to God that righteous shall live by faith. Because things are going to change. The money that you have, it's going to be gone. The health that you have, you know, how long do you think that's going to last? The promotion, the happiness that comes from receiving a promotion, how long do you think that's going to last? The joy of buying a new house, purchasing a new car, how long do you think that's going to last? Everything's changing, but God is not changing. So therefore, fix your eyes on God was the answer that God was giving. So folks, keep your eyes on God who sees the bigger picture. So based on your suffering now, and because of your suffering now, you may be expecting a greater blessing 10 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, 500 years from now. You may say, what good does that do to me? It absolutely does every good to you. Because if God is basing that blessing that has come 500 years from now based on your circumstance, your situation, then you're in a good place with God. Then you're in a blessed, filled, blessing-filled place with God. You're doing okay with God. So folks, do you complain? Do you tell God, God, I thought you were all that. And in that process, you'll get closer to it. But you folks, I could be telling you this, but this is something you have to do on your own. This is something you have to do on your own. You need to kneel down before God and really face the problems that are in your life and face God and tell Him, you know what, God, what are you going to do about this? What should I do about this? 
and be real about some of the questions that are going on. Be real about some of the crises that are going on around you. Be real and own up to some of the injustice that are going on around you. And start having that real question. God shall have the answer. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for giving us this blessing to be able to start a brand new series on the book of Habakkuk. As we continue on navigating through this, through the book of Habakkuk, give us wisdom and help us to continue to find ways to, to gain the wisdom to live by faith. For that is what Christians ought to confess. Thank you in Christ that we pray. Amen.